I come in, March? I know you're there. No. Pity. Because I have a subject of some interest to you. No. Cusby. John Cusby of Cusby and Cusby is outside. He's been waiting almost half an hour. Well, I'm sorry, but I told Patty Wentworth I'd complete this bracelet for her. She's been waiting 12 years. It's her 12th birthday. Why have I been kept waiting so long? Colonel March, Mr. Cusby. Mr. Cusby has come to make a complaint. Well, you're in D3, often known as the Department of Queer Complaints. Are you implying, sir, that there's something strange about me? Well, shall we say rather about the uh, subject of your complaint? You may judge for yourself. The man's a witch doctor. Splendid. My wife is under the malicious influence of a creature who has so dominated her will that with the aid of his evil powers, he will drive her to commit suicide. Mr. Cusby is referring to Dr. James Patton. Celebrated psychoanalyst. What he pretends to be has no interest to me. But if the police cannot stop him from influencing my wife, I promise you, I'll kill him. Thank you, and good day. Some 30 years ago, in Queensland, Cusby was charged with killing a man who was trying to cheat him in a gold mining deal. Then, as now, he publicly announced what he was going to do. I can hear you. A man of his word. Where are you going? To dabble in devil trade. The dream last night. I was alone. It was someone. I wanted to remember. Why can't I remember, Dr. Patton? You never speak to me. Why don't you speak to me? My father slapped me. It was an accident. I didn't mean to tear it. You're too fat. You're ugly. I can't stand to be with you. Go away. Go away. Your hour is up now, Mrs. Cosby. Every time I leave here, I swear I'll never come back. Can't you say anything but mm? See you tomorrow, Mrs. Cusby. Come in, Dr. Hayes. How would you interpret that, Doctor? Very interesting. That's a technique I must master. Even when you say absolutely nothing, you're therapeutic. Hmm. I was wearing my first pair of long gray pants. And the waterfall was making too much noise. And I could see the rims of my glasses because I was short. And her hair was too dark and too long. And I didn't want to go anyway. Only I... Come in. Oh, sir. Thank you. Dr. Patton? <laughs> I wish I were. 
No, as a matter of fact, I'm just uh, trying out his chair. Uh oh. My name is March. I'm Hayes, Dr. Brian Hayes. How do you do? How do you do? I'm the uh, sorcerer's apprentice. The sorcerer is in there, in, in the chamber of horrors, giving advice to the bedeviled. It, can I do anything less intense for you? You are Dr. Patton's assistant? Apprentice. Actually, I'm, I'm a general practitioner in training to become a psychoanalyst. And as you know, part of that training is, is having oneself analyzed. I'm very fortunate in having Dr. Patton as my teacher and analyst. Oh, indeed, yes. He has a very considerable reputation. Yes. Yes, he's one of the two or three that was singled out by the old man, uh, uh, Freud, that is. Singled out for special notice. Yes, Dr. Patton is very, very good. I take it, then, you, you don't altogether agree with his methods. <laughs> the only way to learn is by disagreement. Besides, I enjoy it. Get out of his chair. Get up at once. Temper, Mrs. Patton, temper. The head doctor will not like it. You are bad. A wicked person. That is not what the head doctor says. He doesn't know you. Oh, shame on you, Mrs. Patton. He knows everything. Put it down. Put it down! Thank you for bringing my lunch, Hansi. Dear James, if I didn't bring it, you wouldn't eat. No. Without you, I couldn't do anything. When I saw him in your chair, it came to me you were dead. It comes to me often. Now you see, I'm well and fine. And it seems to me I have done it. Mrs. Patton, this is greatest care. She spent six years in a Nazi concentration camp. She isn't always like this. She doesn't seem to appreciate your humor. She dislikes all people who are associated with her husband because she hates her husband. Yet she brings him his lunch. Mm, every day. To atone for her feeling of guilt. In that way, she compensates for hating him. I wonder if Dr. Patton would agree with your analysis. What husband understands his wife? I'm Colonel March of Scotland Yard. You didn't tell me. Well, I've had very little opportunity to tell you anything. You wish to see me about a police matter, Colonel March? I can't really say as yet. You see, my work in the Department of Queer Complaints is concerned only with the improbable and, well, the frankly unbelievable. You might be giving a description of my profession. <laughs> True, but fortunately our problems are ultimately more material. Before you go any further, Colonel, you should know that under no circumstances can I, nor will I, disclose any information about any of my patients. I will try not to trespass on the ethics of your profession, sir. But I must ask you one thing. What can you tell me about John Cusby? Nothing. Ah, then I assume that he's a patient of yours. If you choose to make such an assumption, I cannot prevent it. What would you say if I told you that he not only accuses you of witchcraft, but threatens to kill you? In the history of psychoanalysis, Accusations are a commonplace. They are invariably accompanied by threats. I've made it a practice to ignore both. You can't get blood out of a stone, Colonel. A very common misconception. Good day, gentlemen. It's a happy moment since I've been coming here. You hurt me. You want to hurt me. You're a monster, hateful like my father. Evil. But you'll see. You'll be sorry. Someone else. Thoughtful, kind, considerate. I'm not neurotic! I won't tell you who he is. I won't tell you! <laughs> You're vicious and cruel, and I wish you were dead like my father.
frightened. I'll see you tomorrow. Well, aren't you even going to say goodbye? Dr. Patton! D3, please, quickly. A Colonel March? Me. Ames. I'm at Patton's office. He's been murdered. You have nothing to add, madam. You realize that it's impossible. Now, see here, madam. Softly, Ames, softly. But you said a few minutes. Would you introduce me to this lady? Colonel March, Mrs. Cusby. Oh. This is John Cusby. <laughs> How do you do, Mrs. Cusby? Can I do something for you? Mark, there's a dead man in there. Unhappily, he won't mind waiting. Uh, some water, perhaps. Evelyn, what are they doing to you? John, John, he's dead. Dead? <laughs> Who's dead? Someone, Mr. Cusby, has murdered Dr. Patton. Good. It saved me the trouble. Let's get out of here. Not so fast. There are some questions I must ask you both. But can't you see she's upset? Another time. Mr. Cusby, don't add obstruction of justice to your threat to kill Dr. Patton. No, no, he couldn't have. You can't think that... Let them go, Ames. In the proper custody, of course. But you haven't heard her story either. But you have, and you can tell it to me. Mr. Cusby, you and your wife will remain available in your own home. You may go now. Here are the facts. He maintained the classical attitude of the psychoanalyst up to the very end. She said she was on the couch, freely associating, as she calls it. When she got up to go, he was dead. She ran and fell over the threshold. That's her story. Oh, a very likely story. <laughs> she admits that she was alone in the room. No windows, no distractions of any kind. It's been soundproof. Fresh air through the ventilating system. He let his patients out here. No lock. Yes, I know. It could only be opened from the inside. The key for that door was in his pocket, attached to his watch chain. Ah. What we have, then, is a sealed room. People would only by a mouth mumbling irrationalities and an ear tuned to transforming discord into harmony. If you're saying she talked him to death, you're mistaken. That was in his heart. Now, we'll find that was her hat pin, I'm sure. And when we do, I'll take her into custody. And I'm sure you'll have a fine case. But for that matter, you could build up a good case against any of his patients. None of his other patients were alone in the room with him when he was killed. Ah, but you'll find that most, if not all of them, at some stage of the treatment, hated him desperately. He provoked it. It's all part of the process. Are you suggesting that I check up on all his patients? Well, I know how thorough you are. Why don't you ever say yes or no? Well, I'll start close into home. Mm. Mrs. Patton, I'm afraid we have bad news for you. Come on, March, I can see your light. And I've got important news for you.
caught you napping, eh? Not at all. I was solving your case for you. In your dreams, I suppose. But of course. What this case needed was an application of the subconscious. The dream trauma, James Patton. And after those pleasant little dreams that you've been enjoying, and that I so rudely interrupted, do you still agree with Mr. Patton? Mm. If you think that you can understand his murder by reading through all his books, you're mistaken, because the case is solved. Congratulations. Thanks to the thoroughness of which you so kindly accuse me, and not, if I may say so, to any application of the subconscious, but rather to the routine, healthy, normal process of the conscious. I followed up your suggestion and checked at his patients. Mm, you must have worked very fast. Yes, I did, but not fast enough. Mrs. Patton, when we left her today, went into their apartment and destroyed every note, every case history, everything that Patton had ever written. Really? Every word. Mm. Everything but this. How did you get that? My dear Ames, the great secret of our working so well together is that I do certain things that you, as a really first-class police officer, would... I'd rather not hear about that, thank you. But in any case, the pin that killed Patton was Mrs. Cusby's. And when I confronted her with it, she confessed. Confessed? Yes. Well, then you have no alternative but to arrest her. And I can complete my nap. Undisturbed. Well, all right. <laughs> What are you doing? Ah, here it is. Hmm? Well, what is it? Guard it carefully, Ames. It's the key. A key I found in a book. Oh. It was very good of you to come, Mrs. Patton. Hmm? There now, Mrs. Patton. Now, I know you want to help us to find the murderer of your husband. Makes no difference. The murderers always escape. Even if you catch and kill them, they escape. Like Adolf Hitler. He escaped. Do you know who murdered your husband, Mrs. Patton? Yes, I know. Who? Adolf Hitler. It's quiet. Now, quiet. what do you want my wife for? You have no right to... All right, please be seated. Very good, sir. Mr. Cosby? What brought you into the vicinity of this building while Dr. Patton was being killed? Are you accusing me of something? I know why you're here, but your wife doesn't. Shall I tell her? I... I followed you. I waited outside. I wanted to kill him. Since you started this... this analysis, I thought... I thought I... I'd lost you. You thought that Dr. Patton and I, that we... Mrs. Cosby, tell your husband why you went to a psychoanalyst. You always have so many things, so many more important things than I. Why, well, you knew I loved you. Did you kill him, Mr. Cosby? Ah, Dr. Hayes. I asked you to come because I think you can help us. I hope that I can. When I heard, I tried to call you and tell you how sorry I was. But you wouldn't speak to me. I will not speak to you. Ever. Mrs. Cosby, why did you confess to the murder of Dr. Patton? I... I thought that if I killed him, I would be relieved of my anxiety. I told you, March. Ah, oh, yes, Ames. But if you accept her confession, then you must also accept the fact that she's insane, because this murder is obviously the result of insanity. Now, Mrs. Patton, when you said that Adolf Hitler killed your husband, you meant someone like Adolf Hitler, someone with hallucinations, delusions of grandeur? I meant a lunatic. Ah, then if we could find a lunatic in our midst. Ah, that's not so easily done. What you're describing is paranoia, which often manifests itself in ways not readily recognizable. 
We're often in the company of people who are psychically disturbed without ever being aware of it. Mrs. Cusby. Or Mr. Cusby. Yes. Take me, for example. You tell me how I got into the room to do it. Neither you nor anybody else entered this room. Oh. Well, perhaps I can explain. Now, Mrs. Cosby, you will take your customary place on the couch, please. Sit down, all of you, please. Now, Mrs. Cosby, the last time you were here, lying there on that couch, you were saying whatever came to your lips. Would you tell us now what you were saying? I, I don't really remember. It was something about my father. He was dead. And Dr. Patton, I, I didn't really want my father to die. Yes. No, no, I didn't. I thought I... I smelled something in the air. I was thinking about... What was in the air? You said you smelled something. What did you smell? I don't know. I don't remember. What was in the air? What was it? I don't know. It didn't matter. It does matter. What was in the air? Tell us. Tell us. Yes. Yes, I remember. It's here again. Smoke. It's smoke. Fire. It's fire. 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 So you see, no one entered this locked room. Dr. Patton smelled fire as I did, opened the door and met his death. Now, the murderer can be identified in two ways. First, he was a victim of paranoia. Secondly, he knew of Dr. Patton's greatest phobia, his abnormal fear of fire. But only I knew it. No, Mrs. Patton. It was known to someone else. Someone to whom the doctor had revealed the problems and secrets of his life. Ah, at last. The secrets of the Sphinx. Yes. I accuse you of the murder of Dr. Patton with a hat pin stolen from Mrs. Cosby. But surely, Colonel March, even your ingenious fantasies require some kind of evidence. Which will be found in Dr. Patton's records of your case. You knew that your career and your liberty were in danger, and you killed him. Oh, so you're going to hang me? No. Will you come with me, sir? Come with you? Oh, no. On the contrary, you come with me. I'm the doctor. I'll escort you to the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, Mrs. Patton, they don't always escape. 